seriously, thanks for sticking it out. I mean, the last guy in the day, it's either a good thing or the worst possible thing. We'll find out. Um, it's interesting today listening to all of this because it's, it's for me, uh, you know, this is one of the most specific conferences I've ever attended in terms of the, all of the advice and the guidance and uh, that, that the people have brought to the, uh, to the podium. And I'm going to take this in a different direction, but uh, I hope it leaves you with a sense of not what you face today, but what you face tomorrow. And hopefully uh, a vision you can believe because these are things that um, are going to happen to our industry. So you all as designers, as engineers, will have to face in terms of the products that you'll be asked to help build. Um, just first of all, who I am, uh, uh, as he said, uh, I'm the chief creative for a 43-year-old um, creative organization. I've been with Frog for 18 years, and we do a lot of products uh, for the world. And we also do a lot of the things that you're talking about today. So we face, even though I'm going to talk about some pretty wild stuff, we face a lot of the sort of basic problems that, that have been discussed here today. Uh, but I've just chosen not to focus on those. Um, <coughs> We also have the opportunity, um, we have a lot of work with our customers where we get to take on some really formative challenges. Not only just making the devices that these apps will eventually sit on, but making things that transcend what we think a computer is today. And in that sense, I wanted to kind of frame this for everyone as we're really just getting started as an industry. This whole story is just beginning. Um, even though a lot of the discussion today is about kind of how we can take what seems like a settled platform, a settled notion of what we're making, and optimize it. We're just in the infantile states. Also, I wanted to you know, reinforce this idea. This is a big deal. What it is that mobile, what computing has become, is a big deal. It's changing society. It's changing human to machine relationship. It's changing humanity through that. And so I want to first kind of back up and reframe this discussion and not just simply talk about the mobile and mobile devices, but what really began as, and this is turning into an, a deep extension of the computing experience. It started in a very basic uh, uh, manner, something very serious, something you had to be trained to do, uh, something more than anything in terms of the point here is it was away from normal life. You went into a room, you went to a serious machine and you did things that were serious business and it wasn't really part of life as it were. And even though it's grown up quite a bit in any modern expression that you can pick up, we still see it hadn't quite arrived at a place where we think it really is, is headed. Now we've experienced a few waves. This fixed and isolated wave, as I talked about, is something where the machine itself could, could compute for us, could hold information, but it really was disconnected from the rest of the world. And in that sense, we interfacing with it, our relationship with that device is we were operators of that thing. We sat at workstations. And now we're really dealing with a product that is mobile. It's with us. That's a huge change. And it's connected, meaning it's got information about here and now, about each of us. That's great, but we're also right now, we're babysitters of these things. So the relationship between us and these machines hasn't really crossed that threshold where it's truly useful. But if we try and imagine what the future might be, do we see this? Uh, we see some uh, people trying to try that out, and so I, we think there will be some measure of this as the future, but I want to tell a story about another direction where it maybe becomes much more um, interesting to us. Now, when we, part of the, as a designer, we design fundamental devices, and we're sometimes dealing with these such early stage design challenges that we all bring a mental model to it. And the machines that we use now are, are, are still kind of bound by this relationship, this sort of wholeness, just as we as humans are wholeness. All of our facilities are with us, right? And so we think of when we design a machine to do something, that the facilities of that need to be with it. You know, and so you see the machine and all the screen, the inputs, the output, the data storage capabilities um, the, are all there in one box. Even if the box becomes somewhat indistinct, it's there. 
and we've tried to pack ever more sensors into them, but this is starting to break. And the simple fact is the computer as an object is not simply just becoming smaller, but it's losing its identity. It's losing its central role, its, its dominant position. And we start to see the idea of mobility and computing turning into more things like this. Umbrellas that have sensors in them that can tell you when it's raining. A rug that can tell the world it needs to be cleaned. Um, a water sensor that can tell that the sprinkler needs to turn on. We're really talking a, about diffuse systems. A world of computing, computing answers, where things are listening, measuring, watching, calculating, but all around us. And so maybe we look back at science fiction. I like to, to use science fiction as a model. Sometimes these guys are far more prescient than any of us. And we see an idea of a computer that instead of is something with us, we are within it. We are part of this whole solution. And to me, it's also part of a, a, a desire on, on a humanistic end to try and get the computers out of the computing. Because computing is what we want. We want the value of being able to add those superpowers to our daily experience without these boxes. So I want to describe five trends. These are things that will impact you. May, you may be seeing them. Um, and then also five ideas, five kind of pro provocative ways to, to see what might happen tomorrow. First of all, five trends. This computing experience is becoming pervasive and surrounding. So I described two waves already. We're really beginning a third wave. We're seeing an, a phenomena of computing having millions of inputs, thousands of outputs, it's, it's an experience that's always with us, yet we're not necessarily having to carry it. It's something that can be shared, but it also can be, is public or private. It can put together a comprehensive picture of any situation, anywhere we are, and can be enjoyed without a burden of machinery. And a way to frame this, and I often use conceits, because it's, you know, we, we need a conceit before we have a thing. Um, is the world is really the new platform. When we talk about the iPhone, we talk about mobile phones as the platform. We talk about, um, uh, uh, you know, the PC was a platform that allowed us to create an industry. The iPhone comes out, we're creating an industry around that. We really want to look at what might be the next platform. Well, right now, until we have a thing, I want to use this conceit. What if the city is a new computer? And what I'm really talking about practically here is when we have an environment that's full of sensors, when we have big data, big data really is starting to stand up the ability to take and observe thousands and thousands or hundreds of millions of instances of information and put together comprehensive pictures. Now that's the input side of the story. But we're also seeing advances and the diffusion of places where we can engage that information, where we can engage the compute and the, the input and the output. And these things are happening at a personal level, within offices, the number of instances where we can see information being driven to us, projected around us, also projected out in the public sphere. And some of these things we haven't seen yet, but we're we're experimenting in, with things. We actually, in 2007, now this is even a while ago, 2007, we helped GE build what you would call a massive scale computer for World Health Day. And here we rented, with, you know, with GE's money, all of the screens in Times Square. And we used a series of mobile handsets, basically anyone's mobile handset, and a set of PCs down at the floor there, down on the ground, to create a large-scale computing experience. All of the input were those individual terminals where people could tell a story about how they were living a healthy life. And then the story was told in massive scale. So we can see what can possibly happen there. We're also learning to see that this is really a shared infrastructure. This isn't just me and my machine. Um, this is a set of private facilities and a public infrastructure starting to become one as opposed to different distinct ideas. We're also seeing 
that the information we have, we can start to think of this as a second brain of ours, right? We know things, but you can look up in Google all the things you don't know. You can look up in any number of sources information that's not yours and never will be. But this is also a shared notion. This is a shared global brain. And it kind of changes what it means. It also means we are part of this shared system. And in a sense, we're part of, we are the computer. We are, as a collective sense, driving what that, that information is. The second phenomenon is this idea of seamfulness. So I'm going to play a little video here. And what it means is as much as we talk about this seamless experience, at the same time, we're driving hundreds and thousands of new, very discrete expressions of what computing can do for us. Not everything is going to be part of one sort of super generalized computing platform uh, that we work with. And in fact, the greatest uh, uh, segment of Frog's work are these seamful uh, singular pieces. This is a, you need, the, you need the audio here, guys. Do you have the audio coming out of this? I'll turn it way up. But What's happening is these guys have built a series of sensors into their shoes and they're controlling it with a separate computer. It's a lot of fun. But, I mean, as much as it's just cool to see, it's also a beautiful expression of where computing can take us. It doesn't need a screen in that case, but it's one of the most kind of beautiful expressions of what the horsepower available to us and what good interaction design, good product design is. That's the best user experience there. Um, and those things, the more we have sensors stood up, the more we have really smart software, the more that becomes the normal. If you, if you want to add up all the experiences one has throughout the day, you'll have many more of those. You will have these little box level experiences. And there are designers needed for that. The, second, the third here is choreographed inter interactions. Now I want to show you a video. We just made this a couple of days ago. And before I start it, I want to just prime you. There's a, there's a controller in the room that can hear you. So there's just basically a microphone. And then there's a camera. So this is using a, a Kinect camera. And we're just listening to the, the, uh, uh, the actor here. Uh, and so this is real software. And so we're going to show you um, just voice control and then gesture control. But then really what's important is the choreographed control changes the nature of what's possible. Let's see if I can get it to start. Oh, go. Oh. There we go. Do your channel for light one. Can you guys hear it? Turn on light two. So we just asked the light one. Light one. Well, that really busts the. So he's, he verbally asked the lights to turn off, and then now he's gesturally asking the lights to turn off. So that's really the point, and maybe it's a little lost in the, the kind of stagecraft of getting the, the, the message across with that video. But in person, what's happening is we want to be able to control the world around us with software. What we really want is magic here. We want to be able to control this world, uh, and software is the means to do that. And that's going to be one of the most powerful new possibilities. In that case, we look at a lot of explicit interactions, things like um, 
trying to teach gestures to the world or trying to verbally instruct the room around us. And those things are good and they'll do the job, but they're too explicit. And they, they sort of cross this threshold of, of really usefulness. Uh, okay. Um, what's really interesting about what we're trying to accomplish there is by combining a set of inputs, we can just kind of point, you basically point at the chandeliers and say, turn that off, turn those off, you know, turn these off. And that kind of phatic level means of instructing a system is really when we are able to cross that threshold into usability. And this is something we're actually doing uh, with some customers right now. There's also, this is a, 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 a European designer created this interesting concept of just using multiple devices to talk to each other. But again, it's a choreographed interaction. It creates a, a real perception of magic. Beautiful trend. And this last one, this is my favorite, and I've shown this several times. This was actually shown before the Xbox Kinect uh, was released. And this is when software interactions truly start feeling like magic. Now what she's gonna do is draw on a piece of paper, and then she wants the computer to have what she dr she's drawn. Now today we would scan that or take a photograph of it. But look what happens here. So she's drawing. She hands it to the little boy. Now, in doing that, what she's really done is pass a piece of paper in front of a camera so it can see that paper. It's a scanned event, right, in terms of all the kind of geekery computer side of things, but it creates an apparent magic for people. The, the fourth trend is agency. And I think agency is really starting to step up to the story. Almost everything we do and everything everyone showed here today is very, very explicit data we put in and the computer's just spitting it back out in another context. It may combine it in a very simplistic manner, but it's not really making articulate decisions. But we are seeing situations where com the computer is making a very articulate set of decisions in the middle of that process. And so this, I'm gonna show you one of the most extreme cases here and watch how people react to it. Driving oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear lord. Oh my god, this is so fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It, it shows how um, both how much we need agency in terms of the sheer density of interactions that we're going to see in the density of data, but how unprepared we are for these moments. You saw that. Now imagine there's going to be a newspaper headline when we see this happen. When that first Google car collides with somebody on accident, we can accept that if an old man does that, if one of us actually does that. There's a whole court system for that. Everything's been worked out. You know, as much as it's a sad moment, we know how to deal with it socially as a, as a society. We don't know how to deal with it when a computer does it. The quantified life. This is one of the sexiest topics. What happens when all of a, around us becomes measured? Now we started to tinker with this already, right? We as people have started to create our quantified selves. We're living two lives. We have our first life, the fleshy version of us, the real knowable thing. And the one we invent, the second life, the one we manufacture, and it's sometimes a reflection of actual life, but not always. In fact, we can manufacture a completely unbelievable thing. And we are coming to the day when these things can be brought together persistently. And they need to be, first of all, they need to actually be actualized as a singular idea, um, but they really empower us in, in a new level. Right now we're dealing, I'm going to show you a TV commercial that Coca-Cola did that actually puts this kind of in a humorous repose because we are trying to live these two lives and they haven't yet come together. On the corner, since the quarter after seven, I thought you were too good to be true. No 
Beautiful. I love the, the, the mother swinging her baby. She's like, she's just not there, right? She's in that second life right now. I'll show um, so what happens when everything can tell a story? I mean, this is kind of an interesting set of questions. You know, everything in your house, right? There, there's, there's a way to find out. <laughs> um, so I'm a set of provocations here. So you have objects that speak now. Objects could, will eventually convey absolute attributes. They will tell, it, I was in, sorry, I was out. Objects that remember. And it's not necessarily the object has to transfer all that data, but the object is a cue for a set of memories that are stored in any other possible manner. And that cue becomes the real artful part of it. Right? And so what happens? Will we have antiques that we want to buy because of the memories that they might come with? Right? We buy a famous person's uh, memorabilia because the memories of their use of it come with it. Not, it and we're buying not because of the memorabilia itself. Not because of the antique itself, but because of the metadata that comes with this. Data bubbles might be required, fences, to say, when you're at my house, your things can't talk to my things. And they can't take anything home. You can't take my things home, and you can't take the memory of my things home. These objects must be able to forget. We have arguments, and society works because we forget. You have argument with your wife last night, you both kind of come back to the argument with this vague recollection, and you forgive. But if you have a transcript, you're fucked. <laughs> Collective use. New dimensions to sharing. We don't share, partly because of where society's gone in, in the most broad ways, uh, but what if we can loan openly and know exactly where the object is, know who's using it? You might actually create situations where people buy together because they just don't mind. They will know where those things are and be able to loan with a path. We might also have a, created, a curated life. Magazines right now are pushed entirely at us, but we might be able to curate magazines. And it may not be about us, but it's about information that can completely quantify how associated they are with the things we already have. You know, if you buy car magazines and the magazine knows what you have, that magazine can be maybe a better magazine. Um, and we can also, of course, create magazines that are actually reflecting our lives. So maybe five predictions for the future to frame these trends. And I'm not promising these will happen, but I can guarantee a few of these are likely to happen. The first one is the iPhone becomes just a headset. A headset. So the whole iPhone is just something you plug into your ear. So this is a provocation about the screens, right? The idea of just walking around and having the computer just kind of with you. You don't see it, but it's something you can ask a question of. It's something during a phone call while you're talking. It can participate. The second one, we're going to go back to the idea too. The second one is OnStar. This is a great service in the car. It's totally underused. But it, they offer an in-home solution so I can talk to my home. You just say, hey, what's the weather like today? I'm cold. Can you turn it up? Or order me that pizza I ordered last night. Or call the pizza company and I'll order it. You just stand in your kitchen and you deliver that instruction. There's no reason that can't happen right this minute. That's just a matter of funding that product. It's not a technical hurdle. There are also the ability, um, Deb Roy, Bluefin Labs, MIT has shown what happens when you record everything in every room of a house. He built a system uh, for the purposes of tracking his child growing up and was able to track the very moment she learned to say every word. So, so he's, got a, he's got a map, a, da a data map of how she learned to say water from wa to wa wa to water. It's amazing, and this data map shows, for example, the, the volume of words in any part of the, so there's the floor plan underneath that, the volume of words occurring uh, throughout the house. And there you see all the different rooms of the house um, from overhead and all of the activity. And the microphones are picking it up and transcribing it. So the house has its own data history, everything ever said. 
So imagine AT&T offers customers the ability to record, transcribe, log, and search every call the customer ever makes. And to go back to those privacy folks who were talking recently. <laughs> you know, they do this anyway. They just don't offer it to you. <laughs> right? So you have this transcription. What's really exciting to me is not just the transcription, because it is interesting on its own. Just being able to go back and say, oh, did we talk about that? Especially in the business context, that kind of data is incredibly important. But I want to be able to have the computer as a third member. You're sitting there talking with your friend, you're like, yeah, so when is that game? Uh, when's it start? Uh, and and Bob's you know, like, I don't know. You say, computer, do you know? Yeah, it's at 7 o'clock on Monday. Oh, thanks. Basically. It's that third person helping you out, making you smarter, or making collectively the two of you talking smarter, more informed. It may draw up data on your calendar. Hey, hey, you available Monday? I don't know. You are. Okay. <laughs> the, last, the, for, the fourth one, Cisco, creates the whole office, whole home, persistent solu present solution. We imagine video conferencing right now as a camera pointed at us. So we stand prone facing that camera looking at someone else who's prone facing another camera, um, trying to create a natural moment. It's awful. What we really want is this room here, the sort of visceralness of being able to look wherever we want. Um, and if you look, again, Debroy did this for another purpose, but he created a situation where he could move anywhere by putting cameras in every room and synthesizing that into one three-dimensional space. He could create a live stream, a live three-dimensional place. Now this is very low res because he didn't really need it to do much. But it allows the whole space to be the video conferencing moment. So standing somewhere was not important. You just needed to be anywhere, really. We see Microsoft using the Connect invention. So the labs group there is basically constructing space by using the Connect as a wand. Um, so this is a lensing challenge right now. It's not, a, it's not the core technology challenge. They need, they need sufficiently good lenses and they need sufficiently better resolution. But that's a generational problem. It's not a, you know, a, a core problem to invent. So what they've done is look at the entire room and reconstructed it as a three-dimensional model. Which means as a viewer looking into that room, I can look anywhere I want. I can, so if you and I are talking, I can look down at a piece of paper you want to show me as you sketch and say, hey, how about it looks like this? And I can look back up at your face. I can look over your shoulder. You and I can be in one place much more interestingly. The last one's more, oops, last one's more of a wild trip here. Take Molly Mae. These are the folks who come into your home every week and clean your home. Imagine they add RFID to everything. Little tiny stickers, little tiny tags, everything in your house. That's a spine service, basically. This is an idea Bruce Sterling came up with about creating a data model, a data tracking capability for everything around you. Amazon then knowing where everything is and how, what its life cycle looks like. You know, of course, we want to, our inkjet cartridges to be automatically replaced. We also want our AC uh, uh, filters to be automatically replaced. But the same thing really happens to our regular white t-shirts, our undies. You know, those things could automatically be replaced. The milk in our fridge could automatically be replaced. We could create a automated consumer supply chain. We may not want all of that, but a lot of it I bet we do because it's just a pain in the ass. And we also overbuy in a lot of aspects in our life. You might actually create a, a focused sense of what you actually need. And the last one's more of a, a wild hair of, now, now you e auction the things you own, you, but you auction them kind of after you're really done with them or you need the money. Um, but typically they've been sitting in the garage for a while and you're like, ah, I better get rid of that. Imagine eBay is persistently auction auctioning a much greater collection of what you own. Now the truth is you're not going to let it go unless that price is right for you. But the thing is, that opportunity, that draw out from you to another person is more of a persistent conversation, almost like part of a social network, a social structure. And obviously the privacy, um, permissions, things like that have to be invented. But I don't see those as impossible. They're just things we're not familiar with yet and we haven't invented. 
really what I'm trying to say is, ding, yes, computer. Computing is not just these simple devices that are separate from our lives. We are looking at the idea of computing as life, but upgraded. Um, and so as we think about it, we think about what we face and we think about where it's headed, it's heading more into the intimate parts of who we are. So we think about what can we do as designers to really bring this idea to life. Thank you very much.